Do you recognize this SS officer? Yes, he's next to the little boy with the hands up. Who is he? Who is he? This is uh, uh, Blesher. When did you, when was the first time you took notice of Josef Blesher? Blesher, the beginning of 1942. Do you remember the first time you saw him? Yes. Uh, I took my sister to the hospital. She got a typhoid fever. He was at the front of the hospital. And when was the first time you heard his name? His name came up very often because people start running when, those, when he came around the street on his bicycle. And uh, everybody was calling God, Blesh is coming, Blesh is coming, so. When you actually saw him for the first time, do you remember what went through your mind? Well, what went through my mind is because uh, he came around, people were standing in line to get into the hospital. And he was asking one man, what are you doing here? Actually call them, call them your lump. He says, I'm waiting to see a doctor. It was really, um, he said to him, come, I'll give you a doctor. And across from the hospital is the major Jewish cemetery in Warsaw. And he took him on the cemetery and we heard one shot. That was what the end of this man. And when, when you actually saw him for the first time, what did you think? Yeah. I'll just repeat the last question. When you actually saw Josef Blöcher for the first time, do you remember, did you think something? Well, I thought that like everybody else thought of him, he was a killer. And I say this. Do you remember what he looked like? He wasn't very tall. He was uh, actually his partner, Klostermeyer, was much taller than he was. Uh, he wore his uniform always, unless he was in a shooting mood. He was wearing his helmet. And uh, they came in usually after the afternoon driving by the whole main street of the ghetto. Uh, they came in through the gate of Zamenhof in Gensha, and they went through the whole street till they came to the other end, close to the Umschlagplatz. And they went out through the other end. And on the way, they probably shot a couple people. They always found that excuse. You didn't take off your hat, or you didn't get off the sidewalk, and that's how they operated. How would you describe his face? How would you describe his face? His what? His face? His face uh, was not round. Uh, when he was wearing the helmet, his chin was sticking out a little bit because he was wearing the, how would you call it, the, the band that holds the helmet on you. Uh, not round, more a little bit on the longer side. And, uh, mm. Excuse me. Yeah. But the air conditioning is still on. Oh. You can't really hear it, but it's up to you since we already started. You're kind of listening. Uh, uh, unless you, you want to start it again because it's, it is audible, but I wasn't sure. Can you count to five, sir? One, two, three, four, five.
Okay, we're rolling. That's great. Okay. So, do you recognize this SS officer? Yes. Who is he? This is, um, I call, I'll call him Mr. Blesher. Uh, he was usually riding with uh, Klostermeyer on bicycles. He came in from Zamenhof Gate into the ghetto and drove through all Zamenhof from the west side to the east side. And there was a gate near the Umschlagplatz. And that's how they left uh, the ghetto. And on the way, they probably, what we heard later, that probably they shot a couple people because they didn't take off their hat or they didn't get off the sidewalk while they were riding. Do you remember the first time you saw Blöcher? Yes. I, I, he was very close because I took my sister to the hospital. She came down with the... Uh, uh, typhoid fever. I have to use the word already. Uh, and we took her to the hospital. And there was a lineup. The most of the people were inside in the entrance hall. One guy was at, at the door and he came over and asked him, Do was master here? And he said, I want to see a doctor, I'm sick. He says, come with me, I'll, I'll, I'll take you to the doctor. Across the hospital was a major Jewish uh, cemetery. He took him on the cemetery, we heard a shot, and then we never saw him again. When you actually saw Blöcher for the first time, do you remember what went through your mind? Uh, well, we, we, all, we were all scared because the name was going around the ghetto. His name was very famous. For, for being very brutal. Do you remember what he looked like? Well, uh, if he was riding down in the on the bicycle, he was wearing his SS hat. And uh, his face, not round, a little bit of chin sticking out. And uh, if he wore his helmet, it looked a little bit different because his chin showed up a little bit bigger because he had a strap around his chin. And uh, he only wore his helmet if there was a, a what did they call it, uh, they shipped out some people. If they needed a transport, let's say a couple thousand people, then he wore his helmet. What kind of uh, uniform did he wear? An SS uniform, dead cuff on his hat and on the lapels, on the collar actually, not on the lapels, a totem mm -hmm. And did he carry weapons with him? They were wearing a handgun on the right hand side. It was always open to be ready to shoot. His holder was always open. Do you remember what was his actual function or his position as an SS officer assigned to the Warsaw Ghetto? Well, uh, shooting Jews was no, you don't even have to have, to have a rank. If you were in the SS, you could go through the gate freely. Nobody will stop you, but because at the gate were people that they weren't actually Volksdeutschen, that they weren't taken to the army, actually. They, and if they saw an assessment, they just saluted and just passed them by. What this rank was in the SS, I have no idea. Now, talking about the Warsaw Ghetto, tell me a little bit about what was the day-to-day -day life in the ghetto life? The day-to-day -day life, when you walked out in the morning, you, were, you, 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 you saw people lying on the sidewalk covered with paper. People were dying in the street. We're not talking about one person, a lot of people. This was the daily life because you didn't get any work. 
And if you work, you didn't get paid, and you didn't get any food. There was mass starvation. This was life day to day in the ghetto. You were lucky if they, sh if they took you out to a commando, they called it, to work on a Luftplatz or other commandos, you got, you got a couple meals a day. Or there was no work in the ghetto, how could you live? Did they, some, were you taken out on those commandos? Uh, I was not actually taken out because I had a, a past that I worked in a factory to repair the uniforms that came back from the Russian front. We repaired them, cleaned them, folded them, and shipped them back. So that was your day-to-day -day life? Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember when, when you came to the ghetto, you yeah. were just 17 years old, right? Uh, when I came to the ghetto, I was about 17 years old, yes. Do you remember when you came, did you already hear the name Blöcher? No. No. When you think back about this time, is there something that sticks out that you will never forget? Yes, when they took us out of the hideout places when they called it Judenrein and we st stood against the fence with the against the wall with the hands up he was standing next to Strupp the commander of the ghetto I don't know if they co called him commander or whatever other name he had he was the top man of the ghetto he was standing next to him and uh, there was an old man with a beard and uh, he said, uh, Strupp said to Blesha, was soll mir machen mit dem Jude? And he said, I'll show you what I will do with him. And in Poland, they had like courts, housing around, like a square housing with a door, big door in the front that you could drive in with products, milk, or other things. And he told them to walk in the door, he took out his gun, he shot him. This man actually had his daughter visiting then Palestine. She came for a visit with her husband, with a little girl of eight years old. This was a father that was shot. This is the most that has outstands in my mind, cold-blooded. Did you see his can you fix his mic? It's rustling because it's, it's going towards his shirt. That's what you hear. That's what you were hearing because it was running. But it's fine. Okay, because I know that it'll come to shutter. Is it okay to hear the same way that you were Yeah. And I don't have a little 60 to shutter up to hide from him. Okay. We're good. That was good. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> So the event that you just told me about, did, did you see Blush's face when he shot the old man? His face, he didn't blink an eye. The, the man was a sadist. In which way? In which way? Because he could shoot a, a person like, he, he shoot a fly on the wall. This is just not normal. When you think back about that time, Tell me one of your typical days in the ghetto. My typical day, we, used, we came 8 o'clock to work, and we worked till 12. 12 we took, there was a kitchen that cooked food for all the people. We stopped for an hour, and we went back to work till about 5, 6 o'clock. We went back home. What you called home, we were four people in a room. One room, four people. And who were these four people that you were sharing the room with? The people, the four people in the room. There were two sisters of mine, I, and there was one boyfriend of my sisters. And there was one bed. We, we slept across the bed. 
in front of us. You said before that Blöschel was often seen riding his bicycle yes. through the ghetto. You have seen him yourself riding his bike through the ghetto? We, we looked out the window, our window from the factory uh, looked out to Zam uh, Zamenhof Street. When they rode down Zamenhof, we could see him riding on the bicycles. I never saw him alone. I actually saw him always with uh, Klostermeyer. Did you um, ever see him riding his Personal contact? No. Encounter with him? No. I thank God I stayed away 10 feet from him. <laughs> Personal contact meant uh, you have a chance to be dead. He always had an excuse to kill you. Your shoes were not tight, the pants were not straight, he picked on anything. I remember one time he told a person to run. But he told him first to drop his pants. Now, when you drop your pants, you can't run. So he says to Klostam, I see that you, they can't run. So he says, I'll show him how to run. He took out the pistol and shot him. What do you think made him so dangerous? I don't know what background he comes from. Maybe he had a, ch a bad childhood or whatever, or maybe they trained him to kill, who knows? It's, it, uh, he was not, uh, to me, he was, not a, he was a killer, a trained killer. As a matter of fact, when we, I came to visit my sister in the hospital, and uh, I saw some uh, friends of mine that came, they're from the same city, and I asked him, what are you doing here? He said, didn't you hear the shot uh, Morris Greenberg? He was, they had a flour mill in the city, very uh, famous person. I said, how did that happen? He says, he, they said he couldn't find anybody in the street. So he knocked on the door. When they opened the door, he came in. So this Greenberg jumped out the window on the, from the first floor. So he shot him in the back. And he died. Next day, he died. So he was looking for people to. How did, do you remember how you got the first clue at that time, how evil and dangerous he was? Everybody warned us from the factory, lunchtime we shouldn't go out on the street because it's possible that Blesher and Klostermeyer could pass by. We were right next, when we looked out the windows, we could see the Umschlagplatz. When they took people from, they caught people from the street, take them to the Umschlagplatz, we were, they warned us not to go out, because if they were missing a few people, they didn't care if you, have an, if you had an housewife or not. They just pushed you in. So we didn't go out on the street at all. Yeah. It's been very interesting what they were working um, on that he said he and his sister, maybe you, you asked him then on camera. Okay, what was the question? The, the, the question was what, what were they working actually? Okay. What was the work that they did? <coughs> so you said that you could see Blöcher and Klaus Dameyer right through the ghetto from the window where you were working. Yeah. What was it you were actually working? We were fixing uniforms that bullets went through them. We, we called it a little window we put in, a square little window. They were cleaned, ironed, and shipped back to the front. And also underwear was fixed. My sisters were working on the underwear uh, on a different floor. There were shoemakers fixing boots and shoes. They were cleaned, fixed, folded, packed. I don't remember how many in a, in a pack, and they were shipped back to the front. Uh, 
Also, when they, when they took us out of the hiding, I was telling you when they shot the old man, there was a young boy that promised him they're going to let him live. And he was about 13 years old. He should tell him where the people are hiding. So he was telling him where people are hiding, then they shot him too. They didn't keep their word, you know. We knew where we were going, you know, when they took us out. So everybody obviously was very afraid of Blöcher. Oh. Everybody, if you had a hole in the ground, ran. He used any, any excuse to kill. And when, do you remember when you got the first clue of how dangerous this man is? Or well, the first clue was when, I, when he took away the man from the hospital, he shot him. If you take a person for no reason because he said he wants to see a doctor and you shoot him, you could see who he is. Can you imagine what would have happened if you would have ever had a personal encounter with Blöcher? I don't want to think a demon about it. I knew what would have happened. He, he cannot come into the ghetto without shooting a few people. And he, he, he saw what's going on. He saw that people are dying on the street. He had no reason to shoot. They would have died anyway. But he looks for excuses. If somebody is, uh, is uh, I don't know, I, have, I can't find a divorce name for him. And I've been around, in, uh, I've been in Treblinka, and I've been in Majdanek, and I've been in Buchwald. He was the worst of all. Was he the worst because of how many people he shot, or why yes, was he the worst? Yes, because he, he, he shot people for no reason. It, this, this was his daily work, coming in to get and shoot people. You see, I can understand if somebody would do something wrong, or uh, also you don't have to shoot a person because he does something wrong. But uh, this was his job, you know, come again and shoot people. Mm -hmm. If he didn't find it on the street, he went to uh, he went knock on the door. And if they didn't open the door, he should open the door. And what would he do if they did open well, the door? Well, if, if, the, if they opened the door, he had to shoot somebody. Why didn't you open right away? Why did you open so slowly? You see, he looks for excuses, always. Uh, he, he's a, he was impossible, impossible. And I encountered a lot of, a lot of uh, SS murderers, but uh, nothing close what he did. Have you also met Heinrich Klaustermeier? Pardon? Have you met Heinrich Klostermeier? Klostermeier? Yeah. Well, they were always together. Klostermeier was a little bit taller than he, quite a bit taller than he was. But uh, I never had the encounter with them, you know. Because we tried to protect ourselves. Even this didn't work. Uh, I, I never heard about Klostermeyer, they sent me pictures because I saw in the paper they're looking for witnesses. I never heard about Blesha before. When they sent me the, four, the pictures, I told them that he had a partner. Never, they never told me what happened to him. Do you remember names of other SS officers patrolling the ghetto? No. No, only uh, the commandant like Stroop and, the, and those two guys. That they were famous, the famous names, you know. Was Klaustermeyer as feared as Blöcher was? Not, not as 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 uh, brutal. Not yeah, he had also notch, notches in his gun, but not as brutal as this one was. Everybody knows or says that Blöcher was very cruel. Yeah. and that he 
hunted people like other people hunt animals. Yeah. Do you remember incidences that you personally witnessed besides the old man with the beard? The old man and the young boy that, that showed him where we are hiding. This two we shot. And also he shot my friend that uh, my people told me that Blesher shot him in the back. He jumped out the window because he was afraid. Anybody who knew Blesher's coming, he jumped out the window from the first floor and he shot him in the back. So it's, it's close encounter, you know. First of all, we had an underground paper. We knew who was shot every day. And have you seen him at other occasions shooting people? No, I, uh, I'm not going to say that I saw him shooting other people, but we, we, we knew the names of people that he shot on the underground paper. We usually had names, and uh, you know that there was an underground in the ghetto. Uh, the underground, uh, the phones were working uh, two days into the uprising. And then they, they cut the lines that we couldn't communicate anymore. Mm -hmm. So we knew who and who, who was shot and who shot him. Mm -hmm. See, there were no other names, uh, like no other SS that they were, were told in the papers that this and this assessment shot this and this guy. It was all this pleasure or Klostermeyer. And when, when you, do you remember, uh, can you describe the incident or what you actually saw when he shot the 13-year-old boy? What exactly happened? Nothing. He shot a person, got, he got back behind, behind uh, beside the uh, stroop and stayed there like nothing happened. Nothing. He didn't blink an eye. But I mean, this, tell me a little bit about, he told the boy that if she tells him where you were hiding, yeah. you were going to spare his life. So what happened then? The boy went in front or? Well, they, when they took us out from the hiding, they knew exactly where they're shipping us. There were 3,600 people in our transport, and they shipped us to Treblinka. From Treblinka, nobody comes out. But that's what happened. It took two hours to get rid of, of 3,100 people. Two hours. The only thing you heard is, I've seen, I've seen. There was a, a chain fence grown through with shrubbery. They picked, out, they picked us out, 500 young men, to clean the walls and get off the dead. And they, they, were, they were bombarding on the end the ghetto. So there was a lot of uh, rubble, you know, to clean the streets. But when we came to the city of Lublin, they, they told us they have already Greek Jews in the ghetto. And so they shipped us into Majdanek. That's how our lives were saved. And that, that happened after the young boy told them where you were yeah. heading? They, they knew, I mean, they, we knew right away when we came to the first station on the railway that we're going to Tradunka. We knew which way we're going. East was to Auschwitz, west was to, uh, to Tradunka. So they knew, and we found out the first station that where we're going. So they have no reason to shoot. They killed uh, 3,100 people in two hours. I don't think anybody will believe it, but I listen. Why I know it? Because we had to clean out the, the boxcars to ship us back to, to Majdanek. And it took two hours to clean out those cars. And where were these cars? Where were who? Where were these cars that you had to clean Well, out? the cars that they brought in was too long. They had two rails to come into Treblinka. They had to go into the station, move in the, the whole uh, train, unhook half, and put it in the second, in the second uh, rail. Because there was not long enough a rail to put the whole amount of cars. So they, they took out the first one with 
there were couples and, and uh, they were assessed with uh, German shepherds. The people were already traumatized from the sitting 80 people and 90 people in a car. And they you had rows, rows with the dogs for barking, you know, and, and they were going behind the fence to undress. I saw a line lined up, so I jumped out of the car and I went in the line and I was picked to go back. To go back to? Back to, to clean the walls together, but there were, had already other people, so they shipped us into Majdanek. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm talk, telling you this story right now. Now, when we go back to the time where you were still in the ghetto, yeah. um, do you, do you ha have you seen Blöcher torturing people or, or killing people in, in, at other incidences? Uh, almost every day he passed by. It was daily routine that he passed by. Uh, you could hear shots, but we were at the end of the ghetto. As a matter of fact, the wall was in the middle of the street. One was the police side and one was the ghetto. So we were actually on the end of the, of the ghetto. So we could not see. We heard shooting, but we could not see it, you see. Do you know, did, did Bursche kill people also in other ways, but by shooting them? Were there other, were other methods that... Other methods? I, I don't recall hearing about other methods. He probably... One incident was that uh, he, he faced uh, his victim and he kicked him with the knee in the groin and uh, when he bent down, he, when he came down, he turned him, he turned him around, he shot him in the, head, in the back. He had, he had all kind of methods how to shoot. It sounds like he shot people in the back a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess he couldn't face the victims. It's the easiest way. If you get, he shot him in the back of the head, he's dead. You see, I, we had a lot of SS people on the Umschlagplatz, but I didn't see Blesha. And I guess he must have had a rank. I don't know what rank he had. Uh, they had on the Umschlagplatz, they had a regular SS, but not high ranking SS. Maybe there was somebody directing traffic, I, I don't know. But in the morning, in the morning we had a a few hundred people lying and burning. They were burning a stock like it, like hay. They were taking uh, teenage boys and girls, uh, put them in the window on target practice. And then when we came in the morning, when we walked out to the cars, there were a stock of uh, dead people lying and burning. You know, actually, my sisters were hiding me under the, they were wearing flare skirts. I was hiding under the skirt because I was also 1943, I was 22 years old already. I was still a teenager. So that's how, uh, that's how life was in the ghetto, till the end. Connie, we're at 35 minutes. I'm just okay. should that's change, it. okay? together with other people? The only, the only person I saw him with was uh, Klostermeyer. Never, never seen him with other people. Until the end, then when they took us out of the hiding, there were a lot of assess, you know. There was a half truck with a machine gun on top, and there were quite a few assess, a few dozen. But uh, Klost uh, Blesche was standing next to Stroop right in the front. He must have had some rank. I don't know what rank he had. And during, 
during the life in the ghetto, what were there other dangers, let's say, for the women that were present or? There were other, other dangers. There were all, was always danger. Because if they needed, let's say, to ship out 2,000 people to Auschwitz or to Treblinka, if they didn't have enough, they picked you up from the street and pushed you in the, took you to the Umschlagplatz and pushed you in the cars. So there was always a danger. There was, there was no law for Jews, you know. You couldn't say anything, you couldn't do anything. Whoever you, wore a uniform had the power over you. That's it. And um, were, were you, your sisters some, sometimes afraid because they were women? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Women were always afraid because uh, they could kill me. But a woman, you don't know what they did with a woman. They had to go through torture probably till they killed her. You see, so they were more afraid than men. What could they do to a man? They shoot him, he's dead. But with a woman, she could have gone, she, if she got, went through 10 men, you never know how many, how many men went through in a case like that. Have you ever experienced or do you remember that sometimes a woman disappeared or did not come back? Uh, in the ghetto, are you talking in general? In the ghetto? In the ghetto, yes. We had two girls from our city, very famous girls. They were working on the same uh, Luft, Luftplatz that I told you about this picture I showed you. And you know what their work was, just to satisfy the, the, the people, the soldiers on the, on the, on the Luftplatz. Luftplatz. And then when they finished with them, they shipped them in the, in the ghetto. And in the ghetto, they were notified that those two people just came in. They were afraid that they would squeal to somebody or something. So they took them away. We never saw them again. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know. I don't remember the names. One name was Bitter. Bitter. And the other name was... Uh, uh, Hirschkorn. There were two famous girls. But uh, they, everybody thought they were going to save their life. They cooperated as much as they could, but in the end, it didn't work. Did you ever see Blöcher take? No, not with two store girls, no. I'm not going to put them all the blame on him. Not with his two girls, no. The, he had enough on his hands. They were picking up girls out of the commandos every day. Some, some girls would, give, uh, would, uh, would stay out of the commandos because they didn't want to go. Even they had got some food there. They would stay out because they were afraid they would be picked out. So tell me about what happened at the Umschlagplatz. At the Umschlagplatz, they stuffed you in like cattle in every car. We had to stay overnight because they didn't have the cars. They had to empty out the ship. The cars were taken. They, uh, they shipped ammunition to the front. So we had to stay overnight. They pushed us in, in a... In a <laughs> I'm laughing, 3,600 people probably as big as this living room in the den. You couldn't sit down. In the morning, they put us there. Also, you see, people were traumatized before you, before that you did anything. Yelling, screaming, with dogs, hitting. They pushed you in, in, a, in a car that you couldn't breathe. You see, there was no water, there was nothing, you see. So that was the that was the end of the. A lot of people. They, we had people in the car. They stuck out their head to see where we are, where we're going, and they had machine guns on the, on every uh, every few cars. 
And when he stuck out the head, he was shot through the neck. So we had him, uh, till Treblinka, we had him dead in the car. People died. It was a hard day. It was in uh, April. Very hard day. And people just collapsed, you know. And, they, and it was everybody for themselves. Everybody pushed everybody. If he was strong, he pushed everybody away from the window just to get a little bit there. That was it. And it didn't, there were women and children and men? Women and children that, that there was not, they were, they, first of all, when we came to Treblinka, they took away the children right away. And the, parent, the mother was crying, it didn't help. What they did uh, with them uh, on the other side of the fence, I don't know. The only know I heard when the people came in, they start yelling, Aussie and Aussie and, and you know something? I had a girl that worked with my sisters from my city. She actually was a manicurist in the city. They sent back the clothes to our camp in Skarzysko. I worked on a munition factory. They found a picture in a pocket. And they were asking if anybody knows this picture, this girl. And I recognized her. She had a brother working in the same, in the same ammunition factory. And I saw, I know this girl. She was with me in Treblinka. So she shows you the clothes came from Treblinka to this ammunition factory because they needed a lot of clothes because you worked on machinery that spilled a lot of oil. And you need a lot of clothes to change. So I brought from Treblinka the clothes and I recognized this girl, the picture in the pocket. So you could imagine, uh, I felt very bad when I gave it to her brother. He was, actually, her brother passed away about four years ago in Canada. So that, that, that was the life in the ghettos, in the camps. And that's it. And when, when before you were actually deported yourself, the story you told me now, what, what were you able, what, what did you see at the Umschlagplatz? What I saw on the Umschlagplatz, you couldn't see anything. You just, I pushed you in, as I said, in a room like this, standing room only. A few thousand people, and maybe it was, maybe it was as big as my apartment, 3,000 square feet. And in the morning, they told you, rouse, rouse everything with yelling and, and beating and uh, with dogs. And they pushed you in the cars. That's all. Could you, from where you were working, could you see the Umschlagplatz? Yes. Not only the Umschlagplatz, we saw the cars. We saw the cars the way, you see, there were also Jewish police. Everybody thought that they'll survive. The Jewish police helped the SS bring the people into the, to the transport. Can you describe, let's say, when you, when you remember back when you were looking out the window, I yeah. think you said, and you were looking at the Umschlagplatz, can you just describe what you saw, what was going on there? They, they, bring, they brought in the groups. They had to march on Samenhof Street, and there was a big door into the Umschlagplatz. They marched them in, and they uh, if it was daylight, they stuffed them into the cars right away. No excuse. And if they didn't, if there was an empty car, they, they ran into the ghetto and picked up some more people and brought them in for, to fulfill the transport. And was Blöscher involved in the activities at the Umschlagplatz? Not on the Umschlagplatz, only in delivery, the people. See, uh, he was actually, lo it looked like a commander because he was giving orders to the average SS people. That they, the SS people, they had both sides of the fence to the Umschlagplatz. They were assessed inside the Umschlagplatz and outside, and they marched the people into the cars. And what kind of orders was he giving them? They're giving him, schnell, 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 that was the order.
so from from what I understand, only 500 people of about half a million residents at the Warsaw Ghetto survived. Oh, uh, there must must have been more people because they were sent to uh, uh, Arbeits commandos, like the ammunition factories or. Uh, even Auschwitz people survived. Not many, but they survived. I wouldn't say the only five. The only 500 people survived from the last transport. From uh, 3,600 people, the 500 survived. If they survived the war, I don't know. But uh, some people survived in Auschwitz, some people survived in Majdanek. Even in Buchenwald, people, not all the people died. There was a time that dog eats dog, you know. If you were uh, in a barrack that you were given out the bread or given out uh, the soup, you, you always took yourself more. Let's say you could cut up bread for 20 people you cut it, and you could uh, cut thinner slices that you have leftover bread or you have the leftover soup. You could take the soup from the bottom, uh, the thick soup, and give the water soup to the other people. So there was a, people could survive that way, you know. Um, when when you tell me the story about that you got onto the uh, cars to Treblinka, yeah, and you turned around, yeah, was, can you just tell me this story again? When we they cleaned out the cars, we were 500 people. They put us maybe seven, eight cars, and we took to we, we they took us back to the city of, of Lublin. This is very close to Majdanek. When we came to, uh, to Lublin, we were right away heard when they were talking to each other, they says, we, we have 500 Juden in the ghetto from, from Greek, from Greece. So we knew already, we didn't know what's going to happen to us, but we knew that we're not going to the Warsaw Ghetto. But, uh, they marched us into Majdanek because Majdanek was only a few kilometers from Lublin. They didn't use any cars. And they marched us into to, to the to Majdanek. When they came into Majdanek, was no picnic either, you know. And which year was that? This was 1943 in April. There was there was a lot a lot of pleasures in the in the SS. He was not the only one. He's the only one that uh, we could talk about, uh, about the ghetto, what he did. But uh, in, the, in the concentration camps, there were a lot of, uh, not the same name, the, the same uniforms. Mm -hmm. Same, same yeah. actions. Mm -hmm. did, do you have the feeling in the ghetto, did Blöcher make any difference between men or women or children? No. No difference. As a matter of fact, as I said before, the women suffered more than the men. Because he, he didn't shoot a woman, he always found something to do with them. If he, did that, if he didn't do it himself, he gave it to his friends. No difference at all. Um. Everybody knows that there was an underground organization in the war Ghetto, yeah. which you were participating in, I believe. Yes. What do you think was the reason why the uprising ultimately failed? The uprising failed because they had planes and tanks, and we had Molotov cocktails and, uh, and rifles and guns from the First World War. You put in a bullet, you had to cock it and load it again and again. You know, we didn't have automatic weapons. Uh, we had to do something to show the world that, we're not, we, that we, we did something. We knew we're not going to win the war, but we had to do something. We had to, we had to pay a high price to buy a gun or a rifle from the, across, the, across the wall from the Polish side. And also, we operated in groups. Uh, we in, my, in my area, actually, we had about 18, 18 young people. We didn't know anything about the other groups. 
we, talk, we called each other, but we didn't know who they are and what they are. So when they cut off the telephones, we couldn't call each other or connect. We didn't know what's happening in the other end of the, of the ghetto. But in the beginning of the uprising, did you believe at that point that it could be successful? What, what we wanted to do is save some people. The, we had in mind to take some young people and take them out to the forest. But this was the, our only chance. When the first time we took out about 40 young people, girls and boys, through the sewer, we went in through the sewer on our side and we came on the police side. But somebody squealed, we don't know who, if it was our side or the police side, they put in gas in the sewer. And also, the second, we took the second group that were waiting for us. We got caught in crossfire. We, uh, about eight, eight, eight uh, people died. I was wounded twice and we, we couldn't do anything anymore because they knew already the, the way we working, you know, and what our, uh, uh, what actually we want to do. It wouldn't be much, but this was actually the, we didn't have any help from the other side at all, you see. We wanted to, uh, we wanted the Poles to help us on the uprising. We knew that they have an underground. But ours didn't succeed. And then when they started, I'm sure you heard about their uprising, didn't succeed either. See, maybe together, we fought, we fought two weeks in the ghetto. Longer than the war lasted, uh, the first Polish war, German-Polish war. I don't know how long they lasted, I think a month or something. We actually saw the people uh, bringing them into Majdanek, some of those uh, fighters from the from their Polish from the Polish uprising, and some of them went to Auschwitz. But uh, they, they, we had no co cooperation with the Polish underground. It was uh, there were no help. Actually, actually, the Germans knew where, where to make all those camps because they were, uh, anyway, they were not, not our brothers, you know. So that's why it failed. I don't know if we would cooperate, if we, if we, would, if we, if we would have won, but at least it would, maybe would have lasted longer. But uh, you can't fight tanks with Molotov cocktails or with handguns. It's impossible. Actually they, were actually, they were bombarding the ghetto. They couldn't flush us out, so they were sending planes and they were bombarding. So that was the end of it. When you look back and think about Blöschel, how do you, how would you say, how significant is the overall scope of what he did? He, he, was, he was one of thousands, but he was, he was uh, his name was uh, tossed around because he was, he was working around the ghetto and in the ghetto. I don't say that there weren't many like, like uh, Blesche, but the, we saw what he did. We didn't see what the people did in the in the in other parts of, of or other uh, camps or there were a lot like a lot of people like pleasure. And there were also nice people. I have to throw in about there were uh, there were a lot of uh, there was actually an assessment that came over to me on the uh, when the war was going badly to escape from the camp, but I I wouldn't trust them. What would be if he if he takes me out the gate and says uh, that I wanted? Blesheik always came to my mind. That's why I didn't trust him. 
they'll take me out and say I want to escape, and then and I knew the the war comes to an end. You see, so I didn't want to go, but he escaped. Next day he was gone. When, how, how do you feel about the fact that you survived? Uh, how I survived hard work and I kept myself very clean. Because if you didn't keep yourself clean, you were shipped to the gas chamber, just plain open. They looked at you like you are a piece of dirt. And I was also lucky, I worked in the munition factory, I worked in the Hart Rai. You know what the Hart Rai is? Hart Rai is a place where they harden the, the steel that pushes out the, the shells for the holitzers. But this is a simple, uh, just an example, but there were different kind of things. That the steel is hardened and different. One is, uh, you, you get a sheet, and it tells you what temperature you harden it, and, uh, and in what kind of uh, uh, liquid you, ha you put it in to cool it. One was cooled in oil, one was cooled in uh, wax, and one was cooled in salt water. So you see, and I had a chance, I came to, at night to work, we worked three shifts. So every time I came at night to work, I took off the shirt, and I had soap. I washed my shirt. In the morning, I came back to marching back to the camp. Actually, once uh, they stopped me, and I thought that I did something wrong. They put me in a chair, and they, asked, they stopped the whole commando, about 1,200 people. There was a, a hunchback, like also an assessment, Kinnaman. And he asked, warum lieber is so rein? And the rest of you uh, are so dirty. But he didn't know that where I worked, they worked on machines that spilled oil. When the machine went, you had to, and the machine had a special little tube that was running not to get a metal hot. So as it runs, it spilled, the, it's, uh, it spit oil on your clothes. So he didn't know that. But that's how it kept me going, you see. You kept yourself clean, you, you worked hard, and a little bit of luck. That's a, I, I had a SI man, his name was Idol, you know, I, I remember all the names. He was about seven feet. When they picked out where to work, when we came from Maidanek to, to the ammunition factory, he picked me. So all the guys around said, it's a good place, go, don't be quiet. It's a good place, you're going into a right place where to work. And it was good, you see. So, yeah, a little bit of luck, you know. And actually, in Maidanek, when they were picking people, I had still the wound. The question was, um, you were telling me why you survived. Survived. Uh, and uh, it was hard work, a little bit of luck, and you, the main thing you had to keep yourself clean if you could. If you could. And in my Danik, I still had my wound on my shoulder because the bullet came from, probably from far away and got, the lead got stuck in my shoulder. When I came to Maidanek, it was already a uh, pus. So I called for a doctor, you know. In Maidanek, he had butchers, not doctors. They cut it open with a razor blade. The lead fell into a glass. So when they had the selection, I guess you know what a selection is, okay. Uh, I had my shirt over my shoulder. And this idol went around, you know, with a whip, and he puts it under the chin. Schlawine, was, was hast du da? I say, I was working on the, 
and delivering ammunition to the Russian front, and I got wounded. Uh, a box fell on my shoulder. He took me over to, uh, what I'm talking is all about luck. He took me over to the doctor and said, let him go by. He didn't even check me. And my cousin was behind me, but I have him on the picture there. He went to the gas chamber. He was a smoker. He, he, ga he gave away the food for a cigarette. And he started getting blisters, some water blisters on his legs. I don't know what the reason was. And he couldn't make the selection anymore, so. Mm -hmm. I know where he's going. I knew where he's going. And that's why I said a little bit luck. Mm -hmm. And he came once at night. He usually came in through the back door, and I was smoking a cigarette. He says, Lieber, next time I come in and you smoke a cigarette, you know where you're going. So I stopped smoking uh, at night. Because we, when we hardened this uh, all different kind of uh, uh, things that they needed for the for the war war effort, you you when you took it out of the different kind of water and oil, you had a box with sawdust and you had to dry it out with sawdust. They didn't want to use anything that, if you're talking about a millimeter, if it wiped off, it wasn't good anymore. You see? So we used uh, sawdust to wipe off the oil or the whatever was stuck to the metal. So it used to come in through the back door. But that's why I said a little bit luck. He could have taken me out and just give me what's coming to me. He would be right. I had no business smoking, you know, when you're working with sawdust and you're working with the, uh, the next door was ammunition. So he was right. He gave me a warning and I, I never smoked again in the, in the place. So that's why I say a little bit luck. With yeah, I mean, pleasure, there was no luck. You always find an excuse. Yeah, with pleasure, you were just lucky when he didn't. I didn't you. face him. I didn't face him. I only faced him on the end when they took me away, and he, he knew he knew exactly where we were going. The orders were there, you know. He knew the orders, so he, I just I, I stand I was standing against the wall, and the, my eyes had gone going on his face, standing next to. But uh, he had no reason to shoot anybody besides those two people because he knew where he'd be going for good. So I cheated him, what can I say? So that was, uh, he, was he was a terrible man, a terrible man. I don't know, the, I have no idea. He probably had a nice family at home with children. Uh, I would like to know if he had a family with children. Does he have, uh, does he have any offspring that you know? I think he has, I know that he has two children. He has two daughter, children. But I think they might have been from after that time. Are they, do they live in Germany? I think so. Well, if you ever see them, tell her I've never against them. Mm. They're not responsible for his father's de deeds. They could be nice people. He was a murderer and they could be nice people. When, when you think about that moment that you were just describing to me, where you faced him, you know, when... The last, the last day in the ghetto. Yeah. Yeah. How, what, what, was there anything that you detected in his face that was surprising? He was always serious, never a smile on his face. Never. Uh, he was wearing a helmet. You know, they always like to hang around the higher rank than he was. That's why he was standing. I don't know what rank he had. He was standing next to Stroop all the time, as I saw him the last day before they shipped us out. And they never, never very serious all the time. That's all I could say about him. Was he, was he prosecuted by a court? Did he face justice? And what happened to him? 
Was he executed? Yes. I'm sure he had, he had more witnesses, like, uh, uh, more, uh, they knew more than I do. Because you see, if there were commandos every day out and in, they knew about it more than I did because I was uh, protected by the company that I worked for. Mm -hmm. Actually, the company was called Oxaco. So I was protected. But if the people, the people that lived in the ghetto and went every day out and in to work, they knew more about them than I did. So I'm sure they must have had witnesses, probably, that faced them face to face. I'm sure they were. You see. They sent me pictures of the Klostermeyer, but it was years later. And they sent me, uh, you know, it's like you want, they want to trick you. They send you a few different SS people and a few dressed in civilian clothes, and some of them in SS clothes. And I'd rather to make a fool of myself, I didn't want to just say this is him. It was years later, and I said, I really cannot recognize. They wanted witnesses, so, but uh, if, I would be a wit if I would go as a witness, I, I would probably spoil the whole thing, because I could really couldn't recognize it. What, what was the difficulty in recognizing it? The difficulty that I was not, see, if I'm sitting close to you now, you could come tomorrow and I'll, I could explain. If somebody was asking you facial expressions, I could explain to them. But if I wasn't close face to face, if I saw him, let's say, uh, 40 feet away on a bicycle, the blesher I saw with the, uh, the last day in the ghetto, then I could give you a, a, a visually a, a picture of him, how he looked like, you see. But uh, close to my, I was never close to, uh, I never saw him close, so just to go and say, t tell a lie, I wouldn't go, but I, mean, I was sure there must be people that were very close that they saw him often, you know. So from what I understand, Stand um, at some point, you were shown pictures of Blusher as well, right? Uh, Blusher, they never called me. They never called me. I don't know if they, if they knew that I was in the ghetto or whatever. They never called me as a witness. They never, if they would ask me, I would recognize him. So you were not involved in the prosecution or in the trial? No, no. I never, I, I actually didn't know that they caught him. So a lot of, a lot of them died before they caught him. See, they, they were the first ones to escape. Do you know that they had a civilian clothes prepared when the war came to an end? They had a clothes in the, ruck, in the rucksack. Is it in German, a rucksack? Yeah. We call it a knapsack. Uh, they had every clothes that were made by tailors that were working in the in the camps, uh, and they fitted them. They all carried their clothes. The minute the, the Americans or the Russian came, they changed into civilian clothes and they were gone. So, but I never heard about Blesher being prosecuted. What, what actually happened with Blesher is that he lived in former East Germany. Yeah. And he was working in a salt mine there, and yeah. apparently had some kind of accident that, you know, that affected his face. Uh -huh. And um, he had two children, and I'm not. I, I, he got married obviously and had two children, and um, lived a normal, you know, like a regular life. Also in East Germany. Yes. Uh -huh. In in um, near Erfurt. And then what happened is 20 years afterwards, in 1967, hmm. there were some investigations and um, they caught him uh -huh. and identified him as Blusher. And he, um, was, he stood trial in Erfurt and was sentenced to death in 1969. And the sentence was... In East Germany? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1969. Well. He deserved, he deserved every bit of it.
Yeah, I was I w was I would like to ask you um, thinking about execution. Are you generally a supporter of the death penalty? Yes. Yes. Every every person that did things like this deserves. I I'm here for the death penalty. If you kill somebody, you deserve the penalty. It's an eye for an eye. If somebody gets life in prison, I don't even I don't believe in in the, what did I call it? Uh, that these are this a witness against the other people that. I believe in the death penalty. If you're killed, it should be killed. So you consider the execution of Josef Blöcher a just and appropriate sentence? Just, just. I would like to perform the execution myself. I wouldn't blink an eye like he did. I have nothing against his family, nothing. I'm sure he brought home a lot of goodies from the ghetto. They all, they all stole, you know, jewelry and everything, you know, from people. But I have nothing against his family. He was a bad person. And the second generation has nothing to do with it. Although they profited probably, but it's another story. I don't know what happened to Klostermeyer because there was a trial. I don't know if he got some sentence. Or it, wa it was late. I don't think he, he, they, in the West, uh, West, in the West Germany, uh, I don't think they were ready to, to sentence a person to death so fast. Not, that, not that what I read in the papers and what I hear from, in East Germany, I believe it. Even if they would send them back to Poland, it would get the, the death penalty. I don't know, I don't know what was going on outside the ghetto. I'm sure he was not uh, uh, a gentle person outside the ghetto even. If a person works on both sides, you know. When, now that you've learned how, how what happened to Berkshire, how, how does it, what is going on in your mind now? Well, I'll tell you what goes in my mind. I tortured my kids for a long time. Not what I mean, torture, not really torture, but just telling him the stories, all the stories that I went through was enough torture. I have sleepless nights. I never have a peaceful night in all the years since after the war. Uh, whatever you see, you compare. If you see a policeman, if you hurt somebody, you compare him, is he as pleasure? Or if you see a soldier, uh, the, only, the only good thing happened that the Germany changed the uniforms of the people. Uh, the, the Germans had a lot of Ukrainians in the SS. Do you know about it? You, they had Ukrainian units in the SS. When I came to Winnipeg in Canada, they were all sitting, we were working in a factory, song factory, and they were working in a factory. And I was looking at them and I visualized them in the uniforms. After six, six and a half months, I said to my brother, I cannot work here, I'm, I'm leaving. He says, you can never sit in one place. You have to move again. I say, you want to sit with those killers? Sit, because every one of them was a killer. And I left, I went to Montreal. You see, you always see, when you saw, even when I was lived in Germany, although I never questioned the people that I play soccer with or whatever, but you always visualize, was he in the cess? I, my eyes were shown like, was he in the uniform? I know they were all in uniforms, but you see, that's what goes through your mind. And that's how I'm going to die. There's nothing to change. Over all these years when you, obviously you will never forget Blöcher. No. 
when you thought about it, did you sometimes wonder or did you sometimes hope for something that happened? I was hoping, but I never heard. You see, when I heard about uh, the, all the all the officers that investigated this were not easy to give out information. When they called me to you, if I want to be a witness about Klostermeyer, I said, what happened to Blesher? They never gave me an answer. Never. I called a few places. I called the place that sent me the forms with the pictures. I never got an answer. And maybe, I don't know, I don't remember how, how long it is. Maybe they didn't know about Blesher. Maybe it, it was in the East Germany. They didn't know about him, you see. So I don't want to blame anybody. But it's always in your mind. You can't forget it. You lose your own family. How can you forget it? I lost 55 people on the transport in Treblinka when I was there. So it's hard to forget. Uh, I, I tried to keep it away from my grandchildren. I, I gave them all tapes that I made. And uh, <clears throat> my daughter didn't even watch it yet. <laughs> I say, look, maybe when I pass on, maybe you'll watch it. Just forget it. It's, uh, that's how it goes. Life was hard. I survived. I wish somebody would survive of my family, but I had three sisters, they're all gone. And my, my parents, I knew when they shipped out my parents and my younger sister to Treblinka. And then my two sisters were with me. And then my we saw the family on the picture. The whole family was there. An extended family, cousins, aunts, uncles. Uh, everybody from the city, uh, a relative of the of people from our city had the biggest uh, bakeries in Warsaw. And he supplied I don't know, for the army or something, but he had a big bakeries in, in the ghetto also. So he surrounded them with people from our city. That's why in the last transport, we had so many people from our city, probably about 160 people, that they worked around this bakery, or a couple bakeries. That's why we had so many people around. If you had somebody to protect you, you, you lived on a little bit longer. And uh, some people survived in the camps also. I have, I have known quite a few people in Israel. When I went, I met people that we worked in the camps together, and then I didn't know what happened to them. I came to Israel, and I saw them. I was happy to see them. They were happy to see me, you know. And that's, that's the story. Were your, 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 sister, your sisters and your parents, were they deported from the Warsaw Ghetto? No, my sisters were deported with me together. My parents went before us, probably a year before, to Treblinka. We, you know, there was always somebody that knew a Polish person will come and tell you, oh, they shipped out from so and so. So we knew the date, we knew. And uh, actually, one brother died of typhoid fever. He worked on the railroad, and they, so he died. But the rest of them went to Treblinka. All depends from what area you came. In certain areas you went to uh, Auschwitz. From a different part of the country you went to Treblinka. When you think about that you just learned that Blöscher was actually executed in oh, I feel much better now. Much better. At least they didn't live out this life like other Nazis, you know. They lived out this life in Argentina or uh, in Uruguay or uh, even in Germany, you know. They just shipping out from the United States. They took away from uh, Ukraine. They took away the citizen because he lied. He was a guard in a, in a, in a camp. So he's 75, so he lived out his life in a nice country, in freedom. So what has he got to lose now? Nothing. I'm glad that, that they caught him, and he got, he got what he deserved. 
And uh, at least his family will know who their father was. I'm sure they knew. And sometimes they didn't know what goes on in his life as a, as a soldier or as, as an SS person. Because they were probably living in Germany and he was in Poland. He went on, he went on a visit, he probably was nice to his children. They didn't see that kids were hit against the wall, you know, uh, split their heads. So you can't blame the family. But uh, I'm glad that he got, his, got what is, was coming to him. Not enough, but what you can't kill a person twice. That's it. And I'm glad to give this interview. It takes a load off my chest. And uh, if you have more questions, just go ahead. Actually, yeah, I do have a few more questions. Um, you just said you just... Um, um, you just mentioned that probably the family of the SS officers never saw children, you know, what you were describing, smashed against yeah. walls and having their heads split. Did you actually see those kinds yes, of Yes, not, not by pleasure, but I saw by other people. Mm -hmm. Yes. I saw Ukrainians do it. They threw, they threw uh, newborns in the air and shot them. It was like it was like having a cup of coffee. I can't put ever, I can't put everything on pleasure. I never saw him do that, but others did. Many times, many times. So, so Blusher never did these things. But if maybe you could describe for me again, when he entered the gate to the ghetto. How did the people react? React? Everybody was running like rabbits. If you made it into a door, you were lucky. If you didn't make it, you were dead. That's it. They, ca they came in to kill people. They had no business in the ghetto. We had our police, and they had no business. They, they, if they needed 5,000 people, the police delivered it. They only came in to kill people. They killed people that would be dead in a week anyway. We call them the walking dead, you know. If a person said he's going to die tonight, he died. He was covered in the morning. How long could you live without, without getting pe work and without getting food? People used, used to ri uh, risk their life to jump over the fence and come back with some uh, whatever they brought across. And if they got caught, if they were lucky, they didn't kill them, they just took away the food. So that's, that, was, that was life in the ghetto. This where I was through six years like this. From, because in 1939, they came in until 1945. I went on a march where, out of the camp for four weeks. We lost half the people, mostly French. The French were, were used to the good life. The scene that didn't last very long. Uh, mostly Russian and Polish people were more sturdy a little bit. And also they came in late to the camps, you know later than we did. But uh, I remember we were dragging one Frenchman, that, one, uh, me and another guy. And we told them that uh, we could hear the artillery already. We told them, come on, drag, uh, drag a little bit more because you see that it's any, any minute now. We dragged them. I'm, I felt sorry when I went to Paris. I felt sorry I didn't take his name. He survived. We dragged them uh, for an, another day. And the next day, we were liberated. So, it was tough. 
Today people think they have tough times. Today is nothing. Even if you have bread, bread and milk in a family, it's called a good life compared to what we had. That was that. If you to ex if you were to explain to anyone what what Blöcher has done and why he has done it, why I cannot go get into his head. Uh, it's 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 beyond me. I have seen killers more killers than Blöcher in my time, but he especially came in to the ghetto to look for, for killing. I've seen killing in Majdanek, I've seen killing in other places, in Buchenwald, but uh, somebody stole a bread, so they shot him. So they had a reason. I don't think the reason was enough, but they had a reason. But here was no reason. Come over, why isn't your shoe tied? This was the excuse. Or why didn't you walk off the sidewalk when I was riding the bicycle? So you see, it, 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 they came in to kill people, that's all. In the, in the, the name Blesha, you heard more than uh, Klostermeyer. Mostly. The first name came Blesha, then comes Klostermeyer. So, what is that to say? That's it. Do, do you have any, any thought at all why, what could have made Blöcher such an evil man? Well, the, the, after the war, everybody saying he has a, has a bad upbringing. Uh, maybe his father beat him. But there is no excuse to become a killer. Every, every child gets a beating once in a while from the parents. This, uh, this is no excuse, unless he was mentally sick. Only a, only a mentally sick person could go and look for people to kill, you see. If you, how, how, how would you describe from your memory, how would you describe his um, psychological setup? Or how, what, what kind of feeling did do you have? You walked around scared at all times because your number could, be, could have been up any time of the day. See, Jews had no protection. We had no protection. In any camp, in any street, in any ghetto, let's say if a Polish person wanted to kill you, who would never be prosecuted, and they were, they were killing. It's coming out now more than ever that they killed 1,600 people in a city, they burned them in a barn. But the Germans wouldn't prosecute. It was, uh, how do you say, uh, free hunting. You had no protection from anybody. Whatever, even a cop on a camp could kill you and would never, nobody would tell him anything. We had couples in Majdanek that killed four people a day. And well, nobody asked them questions. So, it's a bad memory, but uh, that was the time. Mm. Mm. Do you, from, from what you remember or what you've heard maybe, do you have a feeling Blöcher got some kind of, um, he was bored or, or he was taking revenge? Or did you ever hear anything about you see, there were bad days. Let's say on the Russian front, they must have heard bad news. So maybe he took, he took, he took it out on us. I don't know. Usually, the, we knew when there's bad days on the Russian front. Well, we marched out of the camp. Let me give you an example. We marched out of the last camp. I don't remember even where the camp was. I know it was close to Czechoslovakia. There were salt mines. 
the camps, we, we were, they were stealing uh, machinery from all over Europe and bringing it in. We took them into so empty salt mines to hide them. When we marched out of the camp, there was a, everybody was saying he's an American because he, spoke, he, he must have been in some kind of an intelligent uh, unit. But he was very outspoken. So they put him in a concentration camp. He knew a lot of languages. We marched out of the camp, maybe two kilometers. They hold back the sky, and they hold back the barber of the camp. You heard two shots. Well, for no reason. So I could say maybe they heard the Russian coming close. Every time they stopped to eat, to the kitchen start cooking something. Nobody wanted us to be liberated in the, in the town or village. They were afraid we, they'll be messed up. So every, they made up the, the Russian coming right now. They'll be five kilometers from us. So they marched us out on without food. You see? So who could, why did they shoot those two people? The barber was working, shaving them, cutting their hair and everything. So and I, I could see the two SS people right in the front of me. One had one eye, he lost it on the Russian front. The other one was just a bum. I could see their faces right now in the front of me. They took, they held them back about, uh, I don't know, maybe a quarter of a kilometer. We had two shots, we never saw them again, in a ditch. And the man was an intelligent man, a young man, maybe in his 30s. They shot him, spoke languages, he didn't do anything to them. So who could figure out why they were shooting, why was Bletcher shooting, why were they shooting? You see, yeah, how could you get into somebody's mind? I myself sometimes, when I can't sleep, I think, why did they do that? You still think that today, right? It's, it's beyond me. It's beyond me. Mm. I see a child now, if I, I have an office downtown. If I see a child that he wants a toy and the parents don't want to buy it, so I say to the parents, can I buy this toy for him? So buy it a toy. I never saw this child, I never... You have a little bit of feeling, you know. How can you go into somebody's mind and ask him, why did you do it? You can't even ask him. I can't even... This is not pleasure, but I'm telling you now with those two people. Nothing against them. They never did anything. They were marching just like me. They could have come and taken me. My only thing I did when I was marching is that I was in the front line. I never wanted to hang back in the back. I set the throat, the step, how the whole, the whole people will march. Because if you were hanging back, they had a chance uh, to get rid of you, you see. So that's, uh, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, and I don't think even a psychiatrist could figure out a man like that. I'd like to go back for a moment to um, what you were telling me about Blöcher, what happened when he entered the ghetto, that everybody was running away and trying to hide and trying to be out of his sight. How, how did he react to that? How did what? How did Blöcher, what did Blöcher then do when he saw... Well, when people disappear, I told you, he used to go into apartments. Or he was on a bicycle and somebody was running. He could, you could go faster on a bicycle. He had, he, had, he had to have his victims. Either way. Either he found them on the street or he found an apartment. Or he could pull out a person, like I said, uh, when they were going to work. And you never saw him again. Especially if he picked up women out of uh, the, the group. He knew right away, that's it. So, uh, it's, it's actually, you see, some people gave up because they couldn't run anymore. They were so weak, scared.
skeletons. To him, it doesn't make a, it didn't make a difference if you look good or you look bad. He had plenty of bullets, you know. So that's how it worked with him. You couldn't escape. You were his victim. And uh, most of the time, he found the victims, you know. Either way, you know. If you didn't find them going out, they found them coming back from work. Why, why, uh, why aren't you in step with the other people? He wanted the people to work like, work like an army, or like soldiers. Mm. Left, right, left, right. If you didn't do left, right, he pulled you out. That's it. <coughs> if you wouldn't mind, maybe you could tell me one more time about an incident where you actually witnessed something that Blusha did. Yeah. First of all, the, the guy he shot on the cemetery was one thing. Then my, my, the guy that uh, Mr. Greenberg, he shot him in the back, he ran into the apartment. Uh, what else can I tell you about him? Uh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, somebody was looking out from uh, the window there were still bombed out uh, uh, apartment buildings in the back of the building that we worked. And also a guy from my city, he looked out with one eye and he shot him through the head, from the outside through the window. He was a good shot. He also carried a big, a big revolver, like a long size, you know. Uh, and everybody was shocked in the factory through the window. Oh, the uh, Blesha was in the back walking around. Uh, he just looked out sideways to the window. You could sit and remind yourself stories, but how long, how, how far can you go back, you know? Uh, he was somebody to remember. Do you remember when you, the story you told me now, do you remember the feeling that you had at the time? Was it you were so used to those kinds of things? Happening? When they shot the person? Mm -hmm. I've, I, I've never seen a person shot. The blood was gushing out from his forehead. Oh. And I ran down his... Hold on, Yeah. What I told you, I found the picture of this uh, young girl in the camp from Treblinka. That was her brother that was shot. And I was so shocked that I ran down to her and I couldn't tell her what happened. I told my sisters, my sister told them that uh, Morris was shot, you know, through the window. And. Uh, Things like this, who could remember it? It's so long ago. What is it, about 58 years? Uh, there must have been more incidents. Like I said, uh, there's a few times, I used to go into hospitals. As I said, we had an underground paper. He, this was the only hospital in the ghetto. He used to go into the hospital and ask him, Why, what are you doing here? So the person said, I'm sick. So we got the underground paper, we got sick, he dragged them out and shot him. I could only tell you what we read in the paper, what I didn't see myself, you see. The, the paper was circulated all over the ghetto. We got a paper every night, because the, the people that were on the top, they, were never, they, were never work, they weren't working in any places. They were in underground bunkers. They were printing, relaying, uh, buying weapons. This was their job. So every night we got delivered a paper. And that from these papers we picked out, you know, the names who were shot. And, and always the, the, the name was mentioned was Blesha. Blesha went into the hospital, dragged out this guy, dragged out this woman, you know. After all what you are telling me, 
all the stories and the things you witnessed and the things you saw, how do you cope today with these hor with these horrible experiences that you have to go through? How do you how do you deal with it today? How do you deal with it? Today, if there is a little incident, they send in, let's say there were, somebody gets shot in a the school. They send in 20 psychiatrists. The, the children or the teenagers should, uh, they should talk. They did. We need, every person of us needed a psychiatrist after the war. We didn't get anything. You see now, a lot of, a lot of our people uh, committed suicide. Even here in Los Angeles already, they committed suicide. One hung himself, one, one uh, shot himself. Because the mind that was working like a, like a tape was running now, they couldn't take it. They had families already. And they killed, they commit suicide. By the dozens, that's what I know. And uh, I don't know, I'm not in the other cities what happened, you know. So. It's very, it's very hard, uh, to be honest with you. I married uh, a nice, I have a nice wife, I have nice kids. For me, it was torture the whole life. The whole life was torture. You see, I live in a nice place. I am well off. But uh, if you think back, if you can't sleep, you think back, it's, this is not worth anything. That, that's, that's it. It's a, uh, we didn't get any help. The only help we got is the, they put us in camps and they, we got three meals a day. This is after the war. When I was liberated, they gave me a pair of Wehrmacht pens to put on. So I say, why are you giving me Wehrmacht pens? The Russian will think that I'm a, I was a soldier and I'll go to the, you know where I'm going. And I didn't want to put it on, you see, which was true. The, the Russians have to catch me with a pair of Wehrmacht pants. And they, they didn't know the monkey business. You can, uh, how many people went to Siberia? They, they didn't belong there. See? So that's it. A lot of crazy people walking around till today. They, they exist, but they're crazy. One had a wife and two kids, he remarried. The wife and kids went. A person died and he didn't tell his kids and his wife, the present wife, that he had a wife and two kids before the war. Never shipped out. See, <laughs> so this was going on for 45 years. And the kids actually were very angry. Why didn't you tell me that I had sisters once and they, they were shipped to the guest chamber? He didn't want to give. He didn't want to give him trouble, you know, to live and think what he thinks. So that's what goes on. Life was not easy. First, you can, I couldn't sit in one place. I stayed three years in Germany. I went to Paris. I stayed a year in Paris. I went to Canada. From Canada, I came here. I struggled for a while, and uh, that's how you get old. And pretty soon, I'm going to think on the other side. It was not easy. And uh, maybe it affected my kids also. My daughter, is, she functions, but she has, she has problems also. Uh, I know, I know she has problems because of me. And guy, boys are, are boys. You know, they could take it more than women. They're strong women also, but when you hear what your father went through, and I, I lost all my family, it's not easy to, to absorb and to swallow, you know. So it's tough. She, because what I told her, she's very, very uh, protective of her three kids, you know. And it's not a good idea, you know. You have, you have to let the kids go, you know. But. I guess something rubbed up. That's it. So the last question you have is, I think I know your answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. 
Yeah. But is there any possible circumstance that you could imagine that you could ever mm. forget, forgive Josef Blöcher for what he Blöcher? did? Blöcher? No. As I told you before we start taping, I have nothing against his children, I have nothing against his wife, whatever they knew or whatever, but I could forgive them, but I can, if, as I told you, I could be the, I could have been the executioner for pleasure, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't blink an eye. The man was an animal. Even some animals he could scare off, not to touch you. He couldn't scare off him. So I cannot forgive him. As I said, I, I played with German boys, soccer and everything, and I, I didn't think of it. It was over, and you had to move on. But I, I kill us, I could not forgive. No. Couldn't forgive Blesche, couldn't go give Klostermeyer, and there's, there's quite a few more. But what we're talking about is uh, Blesche, so never, could never forgive him. He was a ruthless person. Uh, I, I tried to find a word for it, uh, more than ruthless. If you take innocent people, you kill. You, you're a, a ruthless person. You're a killer, plain killer, that's all. You have to be crazy to do things like that. So it seems like it. Pardon? It certainly seems like it. I don't know. I don't know what was in his mind. I wish they would have asked him before the execution what was in his mind, why he was killing. I wish I could sit down with the kids, but I don't know. The kids couldn't tell me either anything. I'm sure he didn't tell the kids how many people he killed. But his, his kids must be in their 50s now, or maybe older, or more. Well, we're talking about 1943. If he had kids then, uh, we're talking about what? 1943, 7, 57, 58 years? Uh, 1943, 10, yeah, approximately. So. That's it. Thank you very Anything much. else? I thank you. I thank you. you want to give 10 seconds? And that... Yeah. Okay. We just need 10 seconds of silence yeah. and we're good. You want to put the pictures on the, some kind of... Yeah. that you picked out? Okay, here, let me, let me fix one thing. Let me just... Well, this is not sound, so you'll just, you'll, when yeah, this is okay... You should, just, you should talk a little bit with each other. You know, okay, look, through the look at the pictures. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this was taken... From Springs? Probably. Oh, and, um... This was this taken... This is your relatives and friends. Yeah. This is also the group. Right, right. And then these are some pictures. And this is Egenfelden. Oh. This is in Winnipeg. Right. And this is also in Paris. It's a nice right. picture. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And there is your family, yeah. the deceased. And this is in France. And there France. you are. <laughs> there you are. It's again. This picture was taken. This was uh, probably in Quebec. But the travail. Mm -hmm. This is also Egenfelden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Am I supposed to be talking? Yeah. Uh huh. Don't you have to look up sometimes? Look, we're not even here. So keep going. Just look through the album. There you go. That's perfect. Over the seats. Over the seats. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. What is this? Well, it's a letter, a personal letter. Were you tired? Two when hours, you two hours on the chair. You, More than two hours. I can't imagine that. My God, and I was listening to the radio, but... Um, you didn't you? You're tired? Exhausted? Did no, you remember okay. a lot of things? I remembered everything. Amazing. Amazing. Oh, well. Yeah. yeah, see, this, this is Kapu Zange. Right, right, that was in Israel. Yes. And this was in... This was here. Remember right. the one from uh, right, right in our home we entertained. Yeah. yeah. Very good. And this is the couple yeah, that lives in Montreal yeah. when they got married. Uh huh. And this is when they came to visit us. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Uh huh. Very nice. Very nice. This is your friends. Yeah. Here they are again, and this is us with yeah. the. Maybe so. If you could explain one of the pictures. Yeah. What is it? Well, you could say something. So you'll be talking. You're not talking. I'll be talking? What shall right. I do? Yeah, just comment maybe on some of the yeah, pictures. Yeah, just comment. Uh, well, those are, those are the pictures of my cousin, you know. Mm -hmm. It's in uh, Nagenfelden. This one is in uh, Winnipeg. This one is in Paris. And this family is gone. And this is in Marseille. Mm -hmm. This is Marseille. Mm -hmm. No, what have you got here? Okay, Uh-huh. And this is a, a document mm -hmm. from the Rosso Ghetto. Mm -hmm. It's a nice picture. Mm -hmm. You were very young then. Yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, funny to me as well. Yeah, look at me too sometimes. Yeah. Maybe we should look at this conversation. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, well... A couple more minutes, just keep going there. It must be okay, more well, pictures, you can yeah. just pretend that it is a picture. Yeah. And that's Who's all called, whose card is this? Well, that I don't know more than I don't right. have my glasses, so you would see this. Yeah. This is it's another envelope. So why uh, so why so Yeah. That's right. There we go. Yeah. These are certificates, and that some more pictures. This was a picture. That oh, we is this the Museum? Yeah, that's what it is. The mm -hmm. And those are like brochures that we had and we uh, mm -hmm. this? This is must be This is the the museum here. The museum mm -hmm. of tolerance. Could yeah. you guys go uh, back maybe for just a moment again to the earlier <coughs> photos? And uh, so okay. if you could talk about them just briefly. I look at the go, photos go a little younger, younger as the day. Pictures look younger Picture. and younger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the pictures. There you go. That's, did you have them from there? Yeah. yeah. Well, wonder, you can say something. They, did, they didn't send us a picture. I wonder what happened to them from the Sweden. Right. Well, yeah. they're older now. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. he, must, he must be 85, this guy. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he's still alive. Mm -hmm. Very nice picture. That's a nice picture. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then your aunt is not. Time your out. uncle isn't gone. This was made. Uh, he was in a sanatorium. He was already right. from the cigarettes. He was still smoking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is also a nice picture. Clara went with me. Our class cliche. It was raining that day. This was me. Mm -hmm. I wonder what 
What does it show? So when when did, was that picture of yourself taken? That was taken in Winnipeg. This is Winnipeg, Canada. When you You can see I, I'm dressed for the winter, you know. Yeah. With your hat. hat. And a sweater, you see? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. And this is also from Quebec, huh? Well, it looks like a passport for... Yeah, you know? it must be the... It's not exactly the same. Das ist wohl das erste Papier, das für ihn ausgestellt worden ist, nach der Befreiung. Das ist das Foto auf diesem Ausweis vom 14.09.1945 in Feldefeng. Saying in German what okay, it is. Okay, go ahead. I'm rolling. Am I am I now in the shot? No. no I'm not blocking any any light. Okay. Also, um, dieses Foto entstand oder befindet sich auf dem Ausweispapier, in die ersten Ausweispapiere, die so lieber erhalten hat nach der Befreiung im Lager Feldefing am 14.09.1945. Okay. How about this one? Hold on, I'm still rolling. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me finish these. Uh... Okay. Okay, next. Das sind das Ausweis, die Ausweispapiere für das Flüchtlingslager. Die ersten Ausweispapiere, die ihm ausgestellt worden sind. Maybe you can pan down to... Next time you go down there, maybe go not as far as you can. Let's do it one more time. It's very difficult because it's getting out of focus, right? Yeah, it's because at an angle. Yeah, I know. And I'm using the macro. Oh. to get her uh, okay mm -hmm. rolling just be careful with the carpet because when I move mm -hmm. okay rolling mm -hmm. das ist die Mutter von so lieber vermutlich 1921 auf jeden Fall bevor er geboren wurde it's louder and you have to come over here because it's barely it's not even moving so, still rolling die Mutter von So Lieber. Das Foto entstand vermutlich 1921, also vor seiner Geburt. That's better. So, what was the name of your mother? Um, roll one more time. Yeah, roll. 
Ihr Name war Sonja. Sonja Lieber. Can we bring it up a little? Then it didn't record what I was saying before? Either? I'm sure it did. I yeah. just want you to bring oh, okay. it just for yeah. sure. No, I think it's fine now. As long as it did record. Okay. Okay. That's good where you're standing. Why is it getting dark? Oh, that's me. Oh, okay. Okay, das sind die Geschwister. Lieber. Ähm, ich nehme an, so lieber ist der zweite von rechts. Mit Ausnahme seines Bruders sind äh, seine Geschwister alle dem Holocaust der Judenverfolgung zum Opfer gefallen. Mhm. Uh, what do you? Okay. Also das muss ich noch mal korrigieren, das, was ich gerade gesagt habe, stimmt wohl nicht. Ähm, man sieht hier vier von den Geschwistern von Saul. Äh, er selbst ist auf dem Bild nicht zu sehen. Der Bruder Jack, ganz rechts, ist der einzige, der von seinen Geschwistern überlebt hat. Er ist vor sechs, sieben Jahren äh, gestorben äh, in Winnebago, Kanada. Alright, what's next? Can we just stop shaking and I'll move back? Das ist das einzige Bild, das ähm, aus der Vorkriegszeit von so lieber existiert. Hier ist er zwölf Jahre alt, also 1935. Ähm, so, where was the picture taken? This one in Poland. In Poland? Yeah. In your hometown? Royetz. Kreuz? Ja. Kreuz in Polen aufgenommen, wie gesagt 1935. Kreuz. Kreuz. Kreuz, ja. Okay. Let's go back a little bit. Okay, yeah. just a couple of seconds with the... No, oh, I was blocking the picture with the light, right? Yeah. What's the... Oh, that's the picture. Any chance to get in his face? I'm already using the extender. Really? Yeah, 9 dB. So I can cut out. I you know, made duplicates of it.